so hello Anthony welcome to Freedom Philosophy TV perhaps you could uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, uh, what why you have an interest in the politics of the Green Party sure thanks for having me on your show John well yeah my name is Anthony Samra you mentioned I'm a counsellor, a life coach, and a communication trainer, and those are my full-time vocations. So I'm basically involved in helping people improve their relationships with themselves and other people. I've always had an interest in changing the world for the better, and I guess I probably would have identified as closest to a green when I was in the political sphere, but I, I, get, I suppose I was environmentalist when I was about 20 I actually wrote a book on environmental issues but I was too sheepish to put it out I appeared on the radio and um, I gave a public lecture and I when I was at university I used to write notes on the back of paper recovered from the library that people had printed on one side of and discarded because <laughs> I didn't want to waste paper <laughs> and on some forest environmental and um, some forest restoration projects planting trees and things like that and um, I guess I've always had a love for the environment I guess I'm saddened by the way that environmentalism is handled in the mainstream discourse and I guess that the approaches that are suggested are not congruent with the empirical reality on how we can tackle environmental problems. For myself, I was, I would consider myself to have been duped into believing that the mainstream solutions that were offered up were correct, and I guess I'd like to prevent others from being equally duped, but I would say that a lot of the time those policies are put forward honestly by people who really do think they will help. So hopefully in this talk we can eliminate other potential solutions that would probably be more effective. Hmm. What do you think? Well, I, I've read through the, um, uh, thanks for that, um, I've read I've read through the manifesto, um, and it struck me that I I thought I was reading something written by Marxists. Um, there just didn't seem to be anything much mm. in the Green Manifesto that was really uh, environment about the environment. Um, mm. And I I see they they do have policies. For example, they want to encourage um, people to be able to build their own houses, kind of you know the. Uh, uh, yeah, whether it's straw bale or, or um, reclaimed materials and stuff like that. that. I think that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, but, I mean, my biggest... I, I had, there were two things that struck me that just didn't make sense. One is the big welfare state, which is um, basically paying people to have children and as humans create pollution. I thought, well, surely anything that encourages people to have more children is 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 like the worst thing you you would want to be decreasing the amount of people that are created um, that would be the most environmentally uh, friendly policy to have um, and you know the same uh, around um, uh, having a, a free health care and um, and sort of a free pension scheme as well they're, they're, they're all things that will increase the number of humans that are around and I particularly don't like the, the child policies because I think people should have children from a general, a genuine uh, interest um, in having children. There shouldn't be a sort of a financial uh, inducement there, uh, which encourages, I think, the wrong kind of, of people to become parents. Um, those are my, my, some of my concerns around the sort of the welfare part of it. And the other thing was the recycling um, and now, you know, I'm all for recycling. I think that's great. But again, once, once it, it becomes a, a public policy and you start funding it, then it's like, well, surely the best way for this to be resolved is, is not to support people with their waste. 
dispose or, or, or getting rid of at all. It's to let them pay the full cost of having those products come to them in the first place. So when you receive a big bundle of, of cardboard and plastic, you shouldn't just be able to put it in a box and forget about it. Um, you should have to pay right. pay somebody to take that away and do something with it, whether that's disposing right. of it or recycling. Uh, it's this concept of the polluter pays and somehow the Greens want to apply that to, to companies and businesses, but not to the end consumer. And that, that to me, is, is like right. putting the cart in front of the horse. It needs to be the person who wants the stuff that has to bear the full responsibility for it. And, and, that, and I apply that to children as well. If you want to have children, then you need to be paying the full repercussions of that. Um, and in that way, you're going to re reduce consumption, basically, by... by receiving the costs and and I know the counter argument well that's not fair because some people have got more money and therefore they'll be able to be more mm. wasteful and you know some people can afford children blah 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 um, but that that's another kind of politics entirely that's that's not yeah. going to be environmentally friendly what, what do you think of that those points yeah let's let's come back to the point on children a little bit later I'm really compelled mm. by what you're talking about regarding trash disposal yeah because um there is a cost for, for a product and there is a cost for disposing a product mm. now persons on the left correctly go on about something called externalities which, yes which is when a business or some such thing will pollute the environment and pass the cost of picking up the tab onto the taxpayer mm. what 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 basically socializing the trash disposal does is create massive externalities for the cost of disposing of trash. Now, the, the issue is that recycling I completely support, but we have no idea what recycling is actually more damaging to the environment and what it what recycling is less damaging to the environment because the government picks up the tab. If everyone was compelled to pay to get their own trash disposed of, first, anything that was valuable to anyone, they would either pick up for free or pay for. So all your tins, all your junk and things like that, someone would pay to pick up, including bio, biomass, which could then be delivered to the local farms, which could use sustainably. The more difficult something was to dispose of, the more you would have to pay for it, whether it was plastic or, or card or paper. Um, all your excess packaging, batteries would probably be more expensive, or I don't know, people would come in and say, that's a useful risk right there, I need to pick that up, I can get it for free, because people don't want to pay to dispose of it. That would very quickly create an incentive system that would change the entire way that our society produces goods. Yeah. First, people would become very avoidant of anything that's got excess packaging on it. Yeah. And second of all, people would start bringing, creating things like a fridge or a microwave that's difficult to disassemble or recycle because they're like, I'm going to have to pay 40, 50 quid to get that picked up when I'm finished with it. That will drive companies to create products that are easy to dismantle, mm. easy to recycle, easy to repair, and will do away with excess packaging because no one's going to want to buy things that are packaged and things they're going to have to pay to have picked up. Mm. So if the Green Parties really want to do something amazing for the environment, they're going to have to turn around and say to the public, look them straight in the eye and say, look, people, we need to start taking responsibility for the way we dispose of things here and actually advocate privatizing trash disposal in a piecemeal fashion. Yeah. The way to do that would be first start charging people for non-recyclable waste and then bit by bit phase out phase out government services for picking up recycling waste 
so that the private sector can actually start paying people to pick this stuff up or yeah. offer to pick up for free. Hmm. No, that's great. I to I'm totally on board with that. Um, there was something else around that I had on my mind as well, but um, yeah, they used I've to. I've got a question for you. Go on. Um, um, the, the, the objection that most people will have with is that, well, Anthony and John, your approach will lead, lead to lots of fly tipping. Oh, yes, I've thought about what that. Would your, what would be your um, non state This is quite interesting. It's, it's twofold. Um, first of all, um, fly tipping is a problem for landowners and people with property, and, and it's their responsible to protect their property um, from fly tipping by employing guards or putting up bigger fences or whatever. So at present, essentially, this, this funding of waste disposal is um, a form of subsidy to landowners. It's protecting them from the full cost of their land ownership. So they'll either have to uh, sell off some of their land that they can't afford to protect properly from fly tippers, um, or they'll have to you know, uh, improve their protection, or they'll be become cheaper and more efficient ways to protect property from fly tipping. So that's one. And the other one is, is again, this comes down to private property, it's the problem of the roads. Um, the roads are, are, again, all in public hands. Uh, you, can, you can travel anywhere you like on roads. There's, there's no um, fencing off or enclosure. Uh, communities used to be uh, much more uh, cellular or, or insular. Um, so uh, roads would be watched, people would be around. Um, but, but, the, but the public road system really allows, I mean, it allows criminals and crooks to travel around very quickly. Um, it enables the police and the state to, uh, to send its military around. So, you know, uh, I'm repeating myself there. Um, it's, it's a control mechanism for the state, but it's also an easy flow for criminals um, to, to uh, get access to property and, and to make a mess and, and a problem um, that, that would not exist if we had true private property and our communities were, were gated and fenced and guarded. What do you right. make that? Yes, I, and I think, you know, either it's um, financially worthwhile to whatever gets CCTV and uh, what your property and then, uh, you know, go, go and sue the person who fly taps or it's not. And if it's not, then, um, then it's not an issue, you know. People can get together and create an insurance fund. Yeah. Um, and they can themselves from fly tipping. And if fly, fly tippers are, are caught, you know, the penalties might be such that it was, um, you know, that, that money could go to restore. Uh, to and restorative justice to actually go to the people who it's damaged. Yeah, make them rather clean than up. into the legal. System. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, come. and and also it it creates an incentive for people to look out for each other, mm. and you know, someone could become very popular for doing that. The other thing is that because over time the economy would move because of this lo um, this law or. Or not law if we if we're imagining a stateless society because the trash disposal is privatized all the production will move from using things that are hard to dispose of to things that are easy to dispose of recyclable or biodegradable so most of the waste will be reduced like stuff will start being packaged in biodegradable packaging so someone's going to take that off you for free anyway so there's no need to fly tap in a system where you can get paid five pence per jar, five mm. pence per ten. You know, there, there's yeah. no incentive to fly tap. Yeah, people tend to fly tip things like building waste, don't they? Like um, rubble and um, uh, like sometimes it's like old cookers. Uh, it, it's plasterboard that they don't want. Um, messy old uh, fabrics and things like that. Um, 
but yeah, a lot of it looks like it could be recycled, like like people who dump um, cookers and and uh, washing machines and things like that. Yeah, they, they've got a scrap. There's no, there's no incentive there for those cookers to be easy to disassemble and recycle. In fact. For all we know, there's some planned obsolescence there, and the, uh, the cookers are deliberately need to not last that long because people are not paying the cost of disposing of things. Mm. When they are, they're going to automatically favor goods that are longer lasting over disposable goods, and they're obviously going to favor goods that the company says in its warranty, when you are done with this cooker, we will pick it up for free. Yeah, I, th I think BMW actually. Uh, I, you know, so you know about the BMW cars? I think they have a policy of um, of coming and collecting and taking the car, and I think like ninety percent of it has to be recyclable. And and again, it ha they built it so you can take it to pieces. But I've got a feeling that's kind of been pushed on them by uh, uh, the German state. So. Um, it's, it's not a voluntary solution, um, but I mean, it kind of proves that it can be done anyway. Yes. But I'm, I'm guess they um, have this, the same thing there of, of uh, publicly run waste disposal. I don't know. Um, I'm not, I'm not well read on that particular mm. point. So I couldn't comment. Um, so, if we were to return to your point on children, yeah, um, oh well, the well, yeah, I suppose I don't really think that humans necessarily damage the environment. I think in a lot of cases we improve that. And mm -hmm. wealthy countries actually have the um, resources to put into place recycling infrastructure to replant our forests to um, to clean up our sewage and poor countries they don't actually have the wealth to do that so in places like Bangladesh where everyone's scramping to make a living they yeah. really don't have the enter they, they really don't have the possibility of improving their environment it's up to us rich countries to really pave the way for sustainability but using the free market as we've discussed not using the hand of the state. If the world is overpopulated, I believe, um, according to current trends, and you can watch the BBC documentary called Overpopulated, the world population is going to level out at about 11 billion. I think that overpopulation is a myth, misanthropic myth. Yes. And the idea that that if third world countries are allowed to develop, it's going to be an environmental disaster, is also a misanthropic myth. Mm. These are um, caught up by people who feel very afraid and their emotional reasoning, oh, we, we, we have to do something of the planet. So mm. they imagine that the planet is overpopulated, but that's not actually based on any data. The, the, the yeah. planet population is set to level out at 11 billion at current times. So it's not the number of people in the world, but it's our economic systems. Our economic systems are externalizing the cost mm. of being a wasteful person who damages the environment. Now, the Green Party's policy of putting resources in public hands is actually going to exacerbate the problem. What we have in the current system is forests that are owned by the state and if you want rights to cut down that forest, you go to the state and you get a permit. Now that essentially um, legitimizes pollution and waste. The, the, the state is handing out permits for pollution and such like. What a company can do is it can start a daughter company the daughter company will get a permit to cut down this forest and then sell all that lumber to the parent company for peanuts go bankrupt and the taxpayer will have to pick up the tab
for destroying that natural resource, whether it's a right. forest, a stream, the air we breathe. Now, the solution is uh, private property. Yeah. If you can put that forest in the, ha in the hands of a private company or firm or charity or non-profit organization or, in or individual or environmental group, they have an incentive to keep the value of that land indefinitely. That means replanting a forest, possibly making it ox and things like that, which could be source of revenue or interest or donations mm. to keep the area scenic. Under the current system, it's basically the same as renting a car. If you rent that car, you're not going to take as good care about it as sure. if you own it. People who own property have an interest in making sure if it's a lumber, if it's for lumber, that they can keep on growing trees on it indefinitely. They need to take care of that land. If they can go to the government for a permit because it's owned by the government, they really don't have to take care of it that well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I thought I, I just remembered what that point was. I'd come up originally about waste disposal. Um, oh, well, I've lost it again. Uh, but yes, I agree. Private property does seem to solve the, again, the problem of of environmental uh, damage and waste. Um, I, I don't know. It's it's always true that people won't uh, won't uh, mess up in their backyards. I think I think some people are uh, yeah. that you know. There's some people who are a bit crazy and, and perhaps would do that. Um, mm -hmm. But hopefully there'd be mm -hmm. something like, again like insurance in place and and the neighbours' uh, concern for the damage mm -hmm. to their property uh, would cause uh, these insurance prices yeah. to go up and. So um, again, I think a market would would probably address those issues too. What, what do you think about that? Um, the sort of irresponsible people. Yes, and, yes, and unless um, the political process, all the the funds and efforts that are going to campaigning for parties and trying to use the hand of the state to control these issues, is, is then left. Up. So staunch environmentalists can actually use their organizations to buy up land off abusive owners mm. and put it really in, in, the, in public care. What we call public care is not public care. No. You know, when you, when, you, when you put something in public hands, it's not. It's, the, the government is inherently incentivized to be short-termist in nature. They need to make it look like they're the good person for the election. And if you yeah. can destroy the future, deliver things to people in the present, then who's got that long term of view? If they have to make tough decisions, no one wants a government that's going to turn out around and say, look, this is going to be really hard for you for the next yeah. 10, 15, 20 years. But what we're doing is looking after the environment. Yeah, no the one wants to pay the cost of that. They yeah. want corporations to pay the cost of that, but they don't want to pay it themselves. Yeah, yeah. This, this, what the point that I've gotten that I've just remembered is that some councils actually attempted to introduce um, a waste measure, so they'd have a, a, a chip or something in your bin, and it would work out the weight of what you're throwing away or something like this. Um, and people absolutely went batshit crazy about it, and they didn't want. They didn't want their waste measured so that they had to pay a proportionate amount uh, for the amount of rubbish uh, that they generated. Um, and, and yes, I, I yeah. don't, politics yes. just doesn't seem to be able to address this problem of people's uh, selfish interest uh, um, being what the political agenda always turns into, which is, is again exactly the case with the welfare state and, and um, mm -hmm. healthcare and so forth. It's people don't want to look after their health and and uh, don't want to save up for their children or whatever. They just want it. They just want somebody else to to pay for it, so they don't have to mm -hmm. think about it. Yes, the greens are sort of piggybacking on that public malaise because they'll say things like, we don't believe it's the job of 
private individuals to look after the environment. That's the job of government and corporations. Mm. In other words, you don't have to be responsible for your life because yeah. someone else will pick the, up the tab and then they turn around and talk about corporations being irresponsible. Yeah. So they want to um, promote the private, the public, the voter to be irresponsible. And I, I, I but not, uh, but say, no, it's okay because we're just going to go after those nasty rich people. Yeah, that's well, um, I would like to go over, um, if you're happy to, some of the um, socialistic um, elements of the Green Party manifesto yeah. and talk about those, if you're done on these two issues. Yeah, no, that's great, Anthony. And uh, yeah, totally agreed. And it, like I said at the beginning, it, it's, it's, it's not quite Marxism, but it's, a, it's like a sort of a, it, it's definitely more pink to me than it is green, the Green Party. So. Right. Um, Right. Yeah. Uh, apart, yeah, yes. from, apart from they want to legalise cannabis, which I, I think is probably the, the, uh, one of their more greener policies, <laughs> but for a different reason. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I yeah. like the joke. Uh, right. Well, I, I just um, look at the fact that they want to... Um, they want to nationalize, as we call it in the UK, or socialize, as they call it in the US, yeah. so many things. And this is meant to be, be um, ostensibly a good idea. Mm. And where they want to nationalize is where most of the problems come from organization for, or public-private partnership. For example, they want to make the public transport system uh, um, they want to put that in public hands. Now, for me, one of the great problems with our public transport system is there's massive subsidies in corporate welfare to a few small, small companies. If you want to start up a bus company, there's licensing. You're yeah. going to have to uh, compete with the state's favourite. Now, I don't know if you travelled on CityLink, who now own Megabus and Stagecoach. Right, so they're a they're a state instituted monopoly because the states make, made it difficult for other companies to start up and do what they do. Mm -hmm. I have heard so many people say they are so rude at sitting, they are so unpleasant to customers again and again and again. Uh, and yeah, I turn up just as the bus is at the stance and. And they tell me that I go on the bus and the bus drives away in front of my eyes. Why? Because they're the only people in the show, right? It should be easy as dirt to get a bus and take people from A to B. If you yeah. want to start off, if you want to sort out your public transport issues, we have to stop this public-private partnership. Mm. We need to get government out of the picture. More of the, the, the problem is not going to solve the problem. Yeah, agreed. Now, they're going to turn around and say, oh, we don't want any public-private partnership. We just want to keep it completely in public hands. Could you please um, elucidate from people what the problem with allowing the government to completely take over the public transport network would be? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, well... I mean, you can you can I mean, you can see how uh, completely nationalised industries have done in 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 China and Russia. Uh, they're just not capable of allocating resources, and this is this is uh, of course Mises' uh, a criticism of of anything that's um, uh, that's socialised or nas nationalised and and doesn't respond to uh, customer demand essentially. Uh, and also, there's no way of pricing as well. So, uh, what happened in China is that the uh, Communist Party ended up um, obtaining um, catalogs from Hong Kong so that they could work out how to price their goods. Um, so, it, and you, you and you also end up getting a black market as well, the so-called black market, which of course is just people selling stuff and buying stuff, but. But there'll, there'll be all of these kind of uh, issues, I, I would have thought, that would come up uh, with, with a full nationalization. And, of course, we used to have a nationalized uh, car industry, transport industry under the Labour government. Mm -hmm. 
and they end up just creating uh, cars and things that people don't really want or aren't quite the right models and then mm. uh, the private sector in other countries or the more private sector end up ends up importing uh, cars into our country um, and so essentially the, the then the workers are, are essentially just welfare recipients because they're producing goods that people don't want or aren't quite the right thing um, and yeah it's it's just calamitous now people are going to turn around and say but the thing is it's not your john you know people in small communities they're not going to be able to get buses anywhere because it's not economic for a private sector to to, to give them access to buses mm. then what would be your response to that um well i th i think that's good um it, it creates um yeah, I mean, th this is a, a very common objection to, like, well, how come the um, goods at the village store are so damn expensive? Well, of course, there's the transport costs. And, yeah, it's inefficient to live an isolated life uh, cut off from the supply of goods and things. It, it, and you're going to pay inflated prices for everything. And, of course, that's, yeah. a, that's a decision you make by, you know... I, I, if I if I take a plane to the North Pole and then start grumbling about well yeah <laughs> damn the baked beans cost a lot of money up here you know um, can you not start flying them up here for me on the cheap because yeah. uh, I, I can't afford my beans and toast in the morning you know it's it's like well yeah you've made decisions and you've mm. got the consequences um, and I think it, what it will give though is rural economies a different a different characteristic. Um, so, um, yes, you'll pay more, um, but of course this will incentivize cheaper forms of transport, um, lift sharing, and all sorts of other things that I think would be probably a lot more economical and more environmentally friendly. What, what do you think? Um, I'm satisfied with the response. It's, you, you pay your money, you, you take your choice, you know, if you choose to live out in the boondocks, there's various um, benefits to that. You know, nice clean air, nice scenery and, and, and whatnot. And if you want to organize a bus, then you organize a bus. Hmm. Also, we need to be reminded how heavily we're taxed on petrol in this country. Yeah. And also the government, the governments own the roads. Now people are like, The thing is, we have no idea what transport would look like if the state hadn't taken responsibility for it. Maybe we'd all be traveling about in underground trains. Maybe, but, but the government is like, if it's a road, okay, let's chuck money at it. If it's a railway, oh, it's a big decision. I don't mm. know if we want to... We know one, people didn't want this many roads because if they did, they would have... Yeah government to force them to pay for it through taxes mm. we, we might have invented teleportation devices by now but wouldn't be traveling if they were staying in the suburbs because because the transport was privatized whatever was the most economical for large numbers of people is what would have been implemented yeah. and that probably would have been a much better mass transit them and a lot work from home instead of going to work a um, soul destroying job and wasting two hours in the car. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So, so we really cannot underestimate how badly the government being in charge of these things has been for for society, including yeah. the emphasis on drive, which has been probably worse for the environment than it would have been. If the private sector had been concerned, in which case it would have built more mass transit. Um, so more of the same poison is not going to cure the patient. No. And um, yes, so you were saying that um, essentially the Green Party want, want more of the disease of um, uh, central planning uh, to, to, to be the cure to what is really already a central planning problem. And I've actually given, I think, the roads quite a lot of consideration. I think they would be very different uh, if they were entirely privatized, you'd be paying tolls for the for the maintenance and so forth. Most of the big roads we have just wouldn't exist, and and along with them would go the pollution and the noise. Um, and you, you see what happens um, a little bit um, 
I live, I, well, I, I'm in Thailand at the moment, but I was living in Brighton. And you see these uh, on some estates where people buy um, the road from the council. They buy it back and renature it, that kind of thing. And what they often do is they put gravel down. <laughs> they put gravel down to, to keep uh, it from being used as a rat run. And you get a nice, a quiet uh, neighborhood where, where it's not noisy, it's not polluted, kids can play, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but yes, it's a pain in the butt um, for people who need to travel quickly to work. And of course, that will pass on as a cost um, to employers in certain industries who require people to travel a lot. They'll get that as a cost one way or another. They'll have to relocate people or they'll have to physically build roads. Um, and originally roads were built uh, primarily for military, uh, a military function. That's what, why the Romans built them, to get uh, their soldiers from A to B. Um, but also as uh, merchants. So if, you know, if merchants were wanting to ship um, a lot of, I don't know, silk from place A to place B, uh, where they were selling a lot of silk, um, they, would, they would pay and encourage people to, to maintain the paths and, and byways that existed, um, and that would be a cost of production. So that would be passed to the consumer again, mm -hmm. which comes all the way back to our thing of passing the cost to the consumer and, yeah. and reducing uh, pollution and waste at source by not, pro not producing in the first place or by encouraging uh, more responsible and cleaner production. Yes, prevention is better than cure. And instead of trying to run around putting out fires, we should engineer the society in such a way that we're not starting fires. Yeah. Now, en using the term engineering is ironic because we're not... Um, we're not social engineers, actually. We, we kind of believe that um, without the intervention of the state, people are free to come up with the best solutions for themselves. Mm -hmm. People are not irresponsible, their own interests are concerned very often, or if they are, the consequences soon give them the message. It's yeah. when it becomes someone else's concern that people become irresponsible yes. and, and a fact is like you know a, a 38 ton truck does reportedly as much damage to the roads as 100,000 or 200,000 cars and every year these mm. trucks are getting you know they're obviously lobbying the government to allow them to carry heavier and heavy loads yeah. now that's a special interest group they have the power to lobby if the roads were in private hands Hell no, you're not driving that on our roads. We need to pay to fix that road. Why yeah. are we giving corporate welfare? Why is the freight not on the railway network? Yes. It's, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I think we're done on, on transport. One of the things I'm very disappointed by the Greens, is, and you touched upon this, is their health care policy. And one of the reasons for that is that... You know, I read a book written in maybe 1990 or so when I was a green, and they were talking about the fact that our healthcare system is not a healthcare system of health. It's a healthcare system of sickness. Yeah, it's, it's a disease care know, system, isn't it? it it's, it's a sickness care right. system. You're right. And they were saying that every year politicians get up and say we're treating more patients than ever before as though this is some kind of achievement. Yeah. Actually, in any sane society, politicians would be getting up and saying, guess what? We're treating less patients than ever before because people are less sick. Mm. Now, it seems that the last 25 years have done a full 180 on this and have been resonated back into the left or further to the left and taken the standard socialistic policy, which is we need to spend more money on healthcare, we need to keep healthcare public, yeah. instead of saying actually what we need to do is create a healthcare system that incentivizes health yeah. so that you're paying <laughs> your doctor or your healthcare practitioner all year round and you stop paying them when you get sick or they've got an incentive to keep you well yeah. so they can take on more clients.
and get paid, you know, we need the interests of healthcare practitioners with the interests of their patients in the same way that if you get a financial advisor, he should make more money when your portfolio is doing well and make less money when your portfolio Yeah. The healthcare system has to be made to be profiting when people are well, free healthcare. You'll see people getting offered free phone lines where they can get health and nutrition advice, free yeah. consultations with their G GP, etc., 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 because their healthcare provider stands to lose if they're not well. That's what universal healthcare means the free healthcare that people get when there's a private interest who's invested in keeping them healthy, not treating them when they're sick. Yeah, and um, uh, the other thing to point out about the medical industry is, is another one of these big polluters, and, and medical waste is um, uh, it has to be disposed of uh, in a quite an intensive um, and careful fashion. Um, so there's there's a lot of repercussions to getting people to live more healthily. I'm I'm very passionate about this topic and ha have been for many years. Mm. Um, and of course, You're uh, having, John. having a, a a private um, health insurance scheme, uh, of course, incentivizes people to stay healthier because you, you your premiums will be higher if you have risk activities. If you smoke, mm -hmm. um, if if you uh, eat badly and your cholesterol sky high, it will all get reflected uh, in, your, in your premiums. And so you have the direct financial incentive there to, to make a real change. And you know, if you can't make the changes, well, then you have to go and, and get the support or help that you can. And there's just so much free help around healthcare. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. There's great community resources. Um, and it's, it's all free, basically. It's on the internet. It's on YouTube. Um, it just needs people to have the incentive to go and do it, which which is taken away again by this, um, you know, in quotes, free healthcare, which is not, of course, free, and the consequences of it are dire. You know, when laser eye surgery first came out. Only very rich people can afford it. Yeah. Now lots of people can afford it because the market was at work and yes. they learned to provide that service very cheaply. Whereas healthcare remains very, very costly. Mm. Now on a free market, we'd soon see the cost of healthcare provision plummet, which means that where people are sick and don't have the means to pay for healthcare, they're excuse me, their communities can step in. Yeah. On your point of private health insurance, you know, if I'm your healthcare um, insurance provider and I know I'm going to have to shell out 40,000 pounds if you get a heart attack for on your medical care because you've paid your premiums, I'm going to want to say, John, we're going to offer you free visits to your GP once a month and free access to a phone line so that you can deal with your addictive behaviors around food, you know. Yeah. We, can, we can provide therapy for you if you need it. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's in our interest that you get your issues sorted out because we don't want to have to shell out £40,000 for you. It's cheaper for us to give you this free stuff exactly. than actually for you to get a heart attack. Yeah. Now, now if you do not take advantage of these services that we're giving you for free, we're afraid that we're going to have to raise your premium significantly mm. when you come to renew your contract and also go to all the other insurance companies and let them know sure. about your profile so that you can get yeah. health insurance. Now, John, someone is going to come back to us and say, well, that sounds very good in theory, but in practice... Look at America's healthcare system. They have trouble with private insurance. And what is your rebuttal of that point? Well, of course, it isn't privatized. It's like the banking system. It's cartelized, isn't it? It's, it's another uh, niche created by, by the uh, uh, joining of the public mm. and private sectors um, and, and creating um, a, a regulatory uh, capture. 
for health providers. So, that, and of course, driving up the cost of becoming doctors with all the uh, regulation that surrounds medicine. And that there used to be uh, before um, doctors you know, sort of unionized and protected themselves. Uh, they used to, it used to be a quite a poorly paid profession, uh, and, and poor people would would club up basically and, and uh, uh, pull their money and compete, uh, or cause the doctors to compete um, to to have access to huge pools of patients to treat, and so that kept helped to keep the cost of healthcare down. And that that's when it was all private. There was there was no health service and, and, and no unionization, uh, uh, cartelizing and protecting uh, healthcare workers. Um, so it, it was, I think, the best of both worlds. Um, but of course, it meant that uh, doctors and nurses didn't have uh, six-figure salaries like they do now. Uh, well, maybe not the nurses, but uh, certainly uh, doctors yes. were very well paid. And if people want to hear more about the history there is an article called How Government Solved the Healthcare Crisis. Yeah, I'll put links and to you that. you can just and type that into the phone. Yeah, I'll put links and to that. Also, and also that is available on YouTube as a talk as well. So if you don't like reading and you prefer to hear it, it's very nicely read. Yeah, that's a great, now, that's a great one. Uh, we'll have to wrap up pretty soon, Anthony. Um, I, did, I did just want to add something here that... Um, Natalie Bennett had, had, had done a series, I think, of disastrous interviews uh, in the mass media. Um, I think she got pretty much destroyed on Sunday Politics and also on a radio program, I think it was LB, LBC. Um, and the, but basically, it comes, always comes back to how do you fund all this? And of course, they want to extort the, um, yes. the taxpayer, the productive class, the multinationals, the, the big landowners. They just want to tax all of that. Um, but the numbers just don't add up, and uh, there's there's a sort of mm. collective collective denial amongst Greens about uh, fine. Well, I say Greens, I, I think they're more pinks than Greens again. But there's a collective denial that um, the numbers don't add up, and uh, I, I just don't think it. You know, it just doesn't look like it's going to work even on paper uh, before they started actually doing it and finding out the reality of it. Uh, so could I just have some closing comments from you? Or oh, anything else? Well, I would just encourage people to look into free market solutions to our environmental problems. Yeah. You don't have to love the free market. I mean, you can even believe that capitalism is a system of exploitation, competition, tooth and nail the rich eating the poor. But yeah. if you're interested in environmental issues, please take the time just to research what our arguments are with an open mind. You might mm. be very surprised. You know, we've got some very strong cases for environmental solutions. And, you know, we care about the environment too. None of us want to breathe clean, dirty air. None of us want to drink unclean water, sure. and um, we don't want to see all the trees cut down. You know, we do it. So, so please look into free market and environmentalism when you get the chance, because you might be actually surprised by what we have have to offer. Yeah, a lot of people have lot put a lot of thought into it, and there's a lot of sensible solutions from our side. I think so. I, th I think the, uh, the, the, the so-called free market uh, angle is, is a very interesting, exciting one. And uh, I, I was, I was um, keen at one point to do a program about the green aspects of capitalism, because um, I, th I think there is a story to be told there somewhere. Um, and I think I probably will return to that at some point. Um, but uh, for now, Anthony, thanks so much for coming on to the show. Um, really appreciate uh, this discussion with you. I think it's very stimulating and necessary. Um, and yeah, I'll be posting some links below, uh, including, I think, to some of Anthony's uh, projects um, and hopefully some of this other source material. So uh, thanks again, Anthony, and uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, lovely. Nice to meet you too. And just if anyone's interested, I do put out free self-help videos on improving your relationships and your relationship with yourself. So just pop my name into, into 
YouTube, if you'd like to access any of those resources, then they're free out of the kindness of um, wanting to make the world a better place. So um, I hope that you enjoy those, those resources. And thank you for having me on your show, John. Really, really very much appreciated. Take right. care. Thanks a lot, Anthony. Bye for now.